How long was the ESPN tenure? Three years, four years? Jimmy, I want to say four. The original deal was three years, and I signed an extension, and then it gets a little murky because things started to get So you've pandemic. had some time since you and the company parted ways. How mm -hmm. would you summarize, sum up your tenure there? Was it a good experience, bad experience? What would be the recap? Hmm. Um, I would say it was a good experience. I met the people that I met through that job, like becoming friendly with Mina Kimes. I don't even want to say friends because I don't want her to have to claim me. But like Michael Jr., um, Jacoby, the, the friendships I've made throughout, like L. Duncan. I have this like incredible network now of people who um, I respect. And that was, I would say, far and away the best part of working uh, at ESPN. And the other thing is I think I learned a lot. Right off the bat, I don't know if you remember at ESPN, I did an interview on Vice for Jesus and Mero back when they were on Vice. And I said something that oh, before yeah. in my life would have been yeah. a completely innocuous statement. And it became this big, right away I learned like, oh, you work here, you are yeah. ESPN's Katie Nolan in the headline. So yeah. you just have to know everything you do. Someone is looking for that to reflect on ESPN, um, which was a tough lesson to learn, but also I would say not a, it's not, invaluable like it is a valuable thing to know moving forward of like okay at a certain point you can't just speak freely you have to speak freely while also being responsible and mindful of the fact that people yeah. are looking for something for you to say something that's gonna give them the chance to want you fired i don't know some people just have that urge you know do you think they knew how to use you no you know I don't want to, I don't want to be mean to them. Um, I had like six different bosses throughout my time at ESPN. I, I, there was re or like reorgs that I didn't right. even know happened. And then suddenly we were under somebody else and I'd never met that person. We were also in New York, which, um, you know, they have that new seaport. Well, it's not really new now, mm -hmm. but the seaport studio was new. And I think there was a lot of confusion about who was going to be at that seaport studio and who wasn't. And then, um, it just became like, a we were the, um, and I was okay with this, but we were the lowest on the totem pole in that office. And so it was mm -hmm. kind of hard to get the attention for the thing that we needed. Um, so I would say, no, I don't think they knew how to use me. I wish, <clears throat> I wish they did. They convinced me that they did before I got there. And it, it again, they've got a million people that work yeah. there that they have to be worried about. And I understand why it didn't work out, um, but it, it just to be honest about myself, I wanted it to, I believed it was going to, and then I just think um, too much happened and they didn't have the time to, or the resources or the like belief that devoting any resources to me would be good for them in the right. long run. And One so- One thing I never know. understood is when you had the show, Always mm -hmm. Late, I believe mm -hmm. was the exact yes. title. Yes, thank you for It was on at like 1 a.m. on ESPN Something like that. Or whatever. Sure. But everyone knows that that show's made for like clips. Like- yeah. No one's watching. I mean, I shouldn't say no one, but like James Corden has said okay. this in numerous interviews that I've heard, you know, he's the numerous where he says, like, I don't do my show for CBS at 1230. I'm doing mm -hmm. it for the YouTube, social media. And that was your show. So it was weird to me that it would get canceled. Like it was a canceled based on ratings because I have no idea. They give you a reason. No, I don't think I've ever gotten a reason. Um, from anybody about most things that happen. Um, but I, I, the thing with Always Late is when we first started it, um, it was probably after I think I'd been at ESPN for a year. I had seen the things they had me doing and I was like, can I do a show? And they um, they were like, yeah, we've got, we've got Plus. We'll put it on Plus. We're launching Plus. It's gonna be this big thing. The thing about ESPN Plus, and I think it's because it was brand new, was that you could not there, it was weird about what you could use rights wise on the platform. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it was weird about what you could use off of the platform because they wanted to drive subs. I'm not saying that's the right model. I don't know if it's the right model. That's why I'm not in the business part of the job, but it was the, the it was like, we can't share more than however many minutes per week. I got you. Um, yeah, yeah. I and so that it. became a little difficult. And I think we, we had developed the format of the show, not really knowing that. And so we had these long monologues that then could not go anywhere, but that I liked and I enjoyed the process of making. And I should have probably just pivoted to a bunch of tiny little clips. 
Um, but I, you know, pivoting is not necessarily my strong point. It's, I bet you if you started there now, mm. they, because I feel like they're way more invested into ESPN plus now they know more about, I feel like maybe the timing there was off with you too. Yeah, I think so. I think it was like, I, I'm not the name that's going to draw subs to a, to a subscriber service. That's my perspective on me. I, other people are welcome to a different perspective, but to me, it's like, once you're there and you click on it. I'm not going to waste your time. I, I make sure I put out a good product and that's all I can spend my time worrying about is like making something I believe in. Um, my ratings when I was on garbage time were abysmal. I think I don't, I don't look at that stuff. It doesn't. Well, that was FS1. I mean, nothing. there's so many of those, right? There's so many little asterisks of like, this is FS1. It's a brand new network. Right. It's super late at night and that doesn't do well in sports programming. Right. And because of all those, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to not, I'm going to ignore this number. When I found out that uh, Nielsen ratings were based off of, I don't know if this is different now, but like, it was yeah. 1100 boxes across the country. I yeah. was like, I can't care about that. Right. That's not a real number. Those aren't, that's not a real amount of people. Um, so all I've ever cared about is like quality of the content. I cannot speak to why things were canceled. I know always late when it was on plus they, they canceled it and they called me into a meeting to tell me they were canceling it. And I was like, no, um, I think you should put it on TV. And then after a couple weeks of conversations, I just, it was on ESPN too. And I don't understand how that happened. I don't know that it was just cause I was like, no, but, um, it was kind of a wild turn of events. Um, but yeah, then always late getting canceled to me in my head for me to put that to rest was the pandemic. It was just like, um, which is also strange because it was when sports stopped. And I was like, if you needed a show that you want to keep going, that could be the almost the same show without sports happening. It felt like we were uniquely positioned to be that show. Right. Uh, but I think it would have also required that they pour a lot into making it um from my house or whatever because right, we were all right. stuck at home and i just knew yeah. that wasn't going to happen because they had guys with a lot bigger payrolls that definitely would have needed uh resources so i think it yeah. was just a matter of there being too many talent and me being too extra so the mike golick quote that he um he gave out i think in the past couple of days was he so mike golick jr i should say no mike golick jr um recently left espn going to DraftKings, gave an interview and he gave a quote where he said you know, he had nothing against ESPN, but he said, when you're at ESPN, you feel like you're part of the ESPN machine and it's hard to think you're doing stuff on your own. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that quote, I thought of you because I don't think you, your skill set, your talents, it's not for the ESPN machine. Mm -hmm. So I, that's how I felt about it. What did you think about that quote? That and seems, I mean, that seems to right to me. The tough thing for me is I am a locker room guy. I'm like a team building guy. I like to be part of a team. I like lifting up other people that are on my team and knowing um, that they can do a thing I can't do. And instead of that intimidating me, I like that to be like, how lucky am I that I have access to, you know, like on my softball team in high school, I, I was the chance person. I was big on the chance. Um, I would, I, I was like lead off and I wasn't great, but I wasn't bad, but I was mostly there for morale. It was like, I, that's what I love. And so it's, it was hard for me at a place like ESPN where I'm a part of this incredible team to root for the team, which is my default way, while also feeling like um, being part of the team was killing a part of me. Um, and I don't think I realized until after I left ESPN how much, and this isn't their fault, this is just my, you know, me as a person. I don't think I realized how much I had been kind of like, um, like, deprogram almost like I had been shifted into this mindset that didn't at all make sense for who I was and I had right. sort of started devaluing myself internally in a way that um I don't know maybe some people would be like yeah that's valid but for me it was like no I don't think I lost as much value as the as that whole machine made me feel like I had um, when I left there, I felt kind of worthless, and it took me. I was going to say, I would imagine months. when it first, when the show first got canceled, you leave ESPN, you go through a really rough time, and then you realize yeah. it's going to be okay. Like I wanted to leave ESPN into another job. I was, right. uh, I'd been very weirdly focused on like what people will say about me if I leave ESPN and I don't have something else lined up. 
Like, will they use that as evidence that nobody wants me and that my career was a fluke and that I have failed? And then I kind of had to come to this realization that um, you can't just stay in a room full of toxic gas because you don't know where you're going to go next. You, you just got to get out of the room and then you can figure out where you're going to go next. And so um, it was really hard. I tried to stay off of the internet just because knowing that those headlines might be written, I wanted to make sure I did not read them because right. them becoming real wouldn't make them any more true. So I needed to just kind of avoid. And then I went to a real dark place of not working because I don't think I had realized how long I had been nonstop working to get to this place. Right. And then when you're in the place, it doesn't make you feel like you've done it. It makes you feel like you still have a lot to prove. And so I think leaving and not working right away was one of the scariest things I've done, but also in the end will make me better at this job because I took the time to like process what the last few years have been, like genuinely look back at my successes and allow myself to yeah. feel proud of them as opposed to like, yeah, but that's not enough. I have to keep going. It was kind of like, look, you've done a lot. You've achieved a lot as a person who was making videos out of her apartment while bartending. You got here. So just like take a deep breath, acknowledge where you are now, and then let's figure out what you want to do next. And then of course a curveball came, which was, do you want to be in a baseball Apple, booth? Right. And, um, but I think because well, I had that time off in between, I was able to be like, don't worry about what this says about you in the grand scheme of your career. Just like, do you want to do this? Does this sound cool? Then go do it. It sounds like you have a really good therapist. Can I get a number? I don't. I don't. Oh, really? I don't want to say good that. You. I have been putting off getting a good therapist because you. I know I that process remember. of getting the bad ones yeah. first, and nice. I hate dealing with that. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Um, I'm looking, but not actively looking. I need a. Yeah. I need a good therapist. Yeah, I don't me too. Mine yet. is not doing them still because of COVID, and I'm like, can we? Mm. It's, it's time. It's time. I know. Uh, I don't you like need help. phone session. I will say this. I'm not a big like philosophy and 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 sayings and all this you know mum, you know you go on instagram mumbo and jumbo. someone's giving you like this like life you know, life advice wisdom, but like they yeah. were arrested like three weeks ago exactly um, everybody's an expert yeah. right but the one thing i do believe in and i always say this to people if they come to me if they're having any hard time with anything and it's so cliche and so basic and so simple but nothing helps fix anything more than time mm. like Everything in that moment seems so bad and you think you'll never climb out of it and it's bad, bad, but, and you can't, you have to give it time, which you can't do until the time is completed. Mm -hmm. So it's, but, but it did, and in your case too, it just seems like you just needed some time and then you came out of it. And yeah, you know, I was trying to are. grant myself the time and space to like be ready to do the next thing as opposed right. to feeling like I had to hurry up and do the next thing because if I don't do a thing, then I'm a failure. Right. Um, and you know, still, because I don't have a good therapist, it is still a, uh, it's That's still funny. a battle internally, but, That's um, funny. but I, I feel fine about to stay it. off Twitter while you're doing yeah. the game. That's for sure. But at the same time, I feel like staying off Twitter is like denying that it, it's going to be there. It exists. Right. So it's like, right. eh.